Herod Antipas is the son of Herod the Great. Now, Herod the Great is the one who was there when Jesus was born. Herod the Great, his, uh, Herod Antipas' daddy, was in the palace when the wise men came and said, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Now, Antipas was already born because he is going to rule from about 4 B.C. to about 39 A.D. So he's already born. He is Herod's son. And so when the wise men came and said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Herod the Great is probably looking at his sons, three of them, and realizing that these wise men are not talking about his children, but somebody else who is born king of the Jews. Now, none of the Herods are Jewish. Herod the Great was not Jewish. Uh, he was an Edomite, uh, a son of Esau. Now, Herod Antipas here, his mother was a Samaritan. And his daddy is from Idumea. So he doesn't have any Jewish blood in him at all. So to, I guess, sort of not tick the Jews off too bad, they make him the king of Galilee, uh, the tetrarch he's called, of Galilee, uh, Galilee of the Gentiles. Since that area of Israel is mostly Gentile, no one would really be all that angry at having a Gentile rule over them. So Herod here, considered a Gentile, he is, and remember now, the Samaritans were hated people. So not only was Herod hated for being Herod, but now his son is, Her is, is hated because he is Herod's son, and he's also the son of a Samaritan woman. And you know the Jews don't have any dealings with the Samaritans, we're told. So he's really got a problem. And so when his land uh, or, or his kingdom, if you would, as a prince is given to him, uh, Rome thinks it's best if he should serve in Galilee. And so he does. He's going to argue this point a little bit later, and it's not going to turn out good for him. Uh, he's going to want more control over more land. But Herod Antipas, you and I will get to know him. Uh, but this is what the Bible says. We know him from two instances, probably the Bible, and this one recorded. For he feared John, talk about John the Baptist, knowing that he was a just and holy man. And he kept him safe in prison, of course. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. He loved the preaching of John the Baptist, but he never responded to it. And really, that's probably, if you could think of any preacher who probably could win a soul to Jesus, you would have to figure John the Baptist could do it. John the Baptist preached, and crowds came from all over to hear him. And here, Herod now has John locked up in prison. He has him brought to his chamber, or he visits him in the prison. And they strike up quite a relationship, almost a friendship, if you could, if, if you would here. He hears him gladly, and he hears him often but he never pays attention to the gospel that he is hearing. And I think that's one of the uh, sad uh, cases that we bring about in his life. So again, he is the son of Herod the Great. So let's take a look then and see what good we could find in him. You, when you notice the good, <laughs> it, there's nothing good about him personally. If you took all the bad things that his daddy did, murdering the children. Uh, you know, his dad was a wicked, wicked man. And if you took just the bad from his dad and you put it into his son, that's what he was like. If there was anything good about Herod the Great, there was nothing good about Herod Antipas. He was his father's child with only the bad in him from his dad. Uh, he was a schemer. He was always, he was a, um, oh, 
ambitious person. You see here, he built Tiberius. He wanted to impress Rome, and you know, Tiberius is the name of one of the Caesars in Rome. And so he built this city to show the Romans what a great guy he was. And hey, I'm rooting for you guys. I'm helping you Romans out. Look at me over here. I'm getting the folks here to love you. I'm building you a city. And, and he's going to build several cities. One of them he's going to name Julia. In fact, two cities he names Julia uh, after Caesar's daughter. Uh, trying to really get in good uh, with the Caesars. The problem with the Caesars is when one Caesar gets replaced by another Caesar, they don't like what the last guy did. And they're not usually a family. It's not like there's one family of Caesars. The name Caesar is a title, like king. And so there are several families and factions, really, that went into making up these Caesars. And one did not like the other. Almost never. Sometimes they were related. Uh, maybe an uncle uh, was the Caesar and a nephew will take over. Uh, very rarely a son, usually a nephew or someone along that uh, structure of family. So he's the, the, the only good we could find is that he was able to build stuff. And, and he, of course, even in building, his building was self-promotion. It gave him a way to connect back with Rome so the Romans would say, he's doing a good job, let's give him more. And uh, so he ruled Galilee for the Romans. That's the other good thing. He ruled where Jesus lived. When Jesus went to Galilee, when Jesus was in Nain or when he was in Capernaum or wherever he was at up there in Galilee making his tours around Galilee, he was making a tour through the area that this man was the king of. And then in the last stages of the life of Jesus, you remember he went to Perea, which we call the other side of Jordan. And he was also the king on the other side of Jordan as well. So Jesus did most of his work. Now here's the thing. This man has Jesus walking around his kingdom. He's got John the Baptist living in his palace. And with those two great men, he never hears the gospel. I mean, not that he didn't hear it preached, but he with his own ears, he, the you know, they hear with their ears, but their ears are dull of hearing. And so here he has, if anybody, when he stands before Jesus in heaven, and he is sent to hell, he has absolutely no right to complain about going to hell, because heaven itself came down to him. In fact, you'll recall, well, let's go to the next, we'll take a look at the bad, because then we've got more to talk about. First of all, he was consumed by power. We said already he was ambitious. Constantly looking how he could get more power. This man, well, 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 well you look at that list up there, you notice he divorced his wife to marry his brother's wife. Give you an idea of how immoral this guy is. Now, his wife, his first wife, is the daughter of Artemis, Arteris rather, who happened to be the king of Arabia. Now, Jews and Arabs don't get along. Jews and Samaritans don't get along. Jews and Edomites don't get along. And this guy's connected to everybody that the Jews don't like. <laughs> I mean, his mama was a Samaritan, his daddy's from Edom, and his wife was an Arabian. So there was just really nothing, as far as the Jews could see, there was nothing likable in this guy. He travels to Rome, and while he's in Rome, he meets his brother's wife. It's actually a half-brother. He meets his half-brother's wife, while the brother, we don't know where the brother's at, but he and his, uh, he meets the wife, she divorces or leaves her brother, Philip. Now, let me say, here's the raw deal. Philip is the only good Herod. Philip has the same dad that Antipas has. But he's a good guy. 
from the way Philip behaves, you would not even know that he was a Herod. He was a respected and dignified and proper person. He was the kind of guy that a king should be. But we don't really hear much about him. He's such a nice guy. He's not ambitious like his brother is. So his wife leaves him for this greedy guy. And so when he's in Rome, he meets Philip's wife, Philip, his half-brother, because they have two different moms. They both are the sons of Herod the Great, but they both got different moms. And they make a plan to leave Philip and marry Herodias, Philip's wife. Now, this is why he gets in trouble with John. Remember, John preached to him, said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Deuteronomy strictly forbid that, that you could not have your brother's wife. And so John would preach that at him. That's why John ends up in prison, because Herodias says, you can't let the men say that. Well, it's completely legal, and he's completely correct, but I don't care about it being legal and being correct. I don't like him saying that about us. You've got to put him in jail. So he's locked. Jesus, uh, John is locked in jail because he says to this man, it was a sin for you to marry your sister. Not right. In fact, to make it even worse, not only is Herodias the wife of his half-brother, Herodias is also his niece. I mean, these are goofy people. When the Bible preaches against wickedness in high places, wow. That's just the culture of Rome. Uh, Rome had a lot of that. The, 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 when you look at the family trees of the Caesars, no wonder they were all crazy because they were all intermarrying. They were all marrying their sisters and, and, and Lord knows what else. It was just a crazy. And the kings of the Middle East fell into the same things that the Romans were doing. And so this man marries his niece, who happens to be the wife of his half-brother. So, of course, it's just goofy and, and, and crazy by any standard. It's just wickedness all the way around. So when we look at his bad, he's consumed by power. He makes bad decisions under pressure. His wife comes and says to him, you've got to arrest John the Baptist. He doesn't want to displease his wife. He doesn't want her nagging in his ear. So he arrests John the Baptist. He likes John, though. So he goes to John. Him and John have a lot. And, and he hears him gladly, we are told. And the last thing we know about Herod, this Antipas, is this is the man when Jesus is taken to Pilate. And somebody mentions that Jesus is a Galilean. So Pilate says, is he a Galilean? And they say, yes. Wait, Herod, the king of Galilee, happens to be in Jerusalem today. Take him to Herod's judgment hall. So Jesus, the last thing that we know of this man, one of the last pictures we get of him, is when Jesus is taken to him, and really, what's he want to do? He wants to see magic tricks done by Jesus. The Bible tells us only that he wanted to see Jesus. He had wanted to see him for a long time because he heard of all that Jesus had done. And he hoped. He wasn't interested in whether or not Jesus was innocent or guilty. He hoped to see a miracle done by Jesus. He probably had a lot of blind beggars brought into his palace just in the hopes that Jesus would touch one of these people. Who knows what kind of peoples were there that were brought in, forced to come in. Maybe themselves, of course, hoping to be healed. But Herod, hoping that Jesus would do a miracle for him. Of course, Jesus doesn't even say a word to him. Won't even talk to him. So they dress Jesus up like a king and send him back to Pilate. And that was his small part. He was a small man with a small part in the crucifixion story. But we tell it all the time. That when he went to Herod, Herod wanted to see some 
miracle done. Jesus doesn't even answer him a word. This is the one that Jesus referred to as a fox. When they came, the Pharisees, the Sadducees came to Jesus and said, you know, you ought to stop preaching because Herod is looking to kill you. Now remember, Jesus preaching in Herod's territory, his kingdom. Jesus is going around and around at least three times to make a complete circuit around his kingdom. And they said, Herod wants to kill you. And he says, you go tell that fox. I'll be here today, there tomorrow. If he wants to find me, I'm easy enough. I'm right out here. And of course, so this is the one that's referred to by Jesus as the fox. This is the one who wants to see a miracle at the crucifixion of Jesus. And this is also uh, the one who beheaded John. Remember we told you he, he makes bad decisions when he's under pressure. So he's having a big party for all of his people. His war cabinet, if you would, are all there. All of his rich friends are there. And while he is drinking, his, I guess would be his great niece now, because his wife is his niece, and her daughter, which is not his daughter, but her daughter dances for him. And when she dances, he says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you everything to the half of my kingdom. What do you want? And she goes back and says, hey, mom, he's willing to give me anything. What should we ask for? What city should we ask him to give us? She's thinking big. Mom doesn't want a city. Mom wants one thing. She wants John the Baptist dead. So she says to her daughter, ask for the head of John the Baptist. So she goes back and says, I... I know what I want. I know what I want. He says, what do you want? I'll give it to you. I want the head of John the Baptist. Now we're told that he was greatly saddened by the news, but because of the crowd, but because of his rich cronies that were sitting around him, and because he made a promise, he sent and had John beheaded in prison. And John's head was brought on a silver plate and given to his great niece, and his niece for his wife. So, wicked people, uh, just a wicked man. So, the good, he could build stuff. The bad is all bad. I mean, really, because we have kids in the building, I can't even tell you how bad this guy is. He's, he's bad. Just a, a, a notorious uh, fellow. Nothing, nowhere do you hear anything good about him. I told you he was ambitious, and so let me turn the page here. What lessons then can we learn from somebody this lousy? Well, first of all, a life of ambition is sure to fail. Now remember I told you he was ambitious. His nephew, I guess it would be, uh, comes along. And he has got another relative that you know from the Bible. Uh, Herod Agrippa I. Now Agrippa you know from the stories of Paul. So King Agrippa doesn't like him. And Agrippa wants to rule the kingdom. He thinks that all of Palestine should be united and given to him. Now remember... Antipas had a friend in Rome, Caesar. But Caesars don't last forever. And so one Caesar is replaced with another, and a man by the name of Caligula, who was probably one of the most wicked, wicked Caesars to ever live. But Caligula didn't like Antipas. Caligula liked Agrippa the first. So, unbeknownst to Antipas, he goes, his wife again, says to him, you know what, you ought to go to Rome yourself. And listen, you know, Caligula has given your nephew all of that land over there. You ought to go and say, hey, I deserve the same thing. So he does. He goes with his wife, who is well known 
uh, in the area. So he goes with Herodias to Rome to argue his case before Caligula. However, see, here's the thing about being a treacherous person. A treacherous person has a lot of treacherous people around him. Agrippa gets to Rome first. Builds a friendship with Caesar, Caligula, and then tells Caligula how Antipas is a traitor and really planning against him. So that when Antipas gets to Rome, Caesar has him arrested for treason. Nobody really knows what that treason was except for whatever it was that uh, Agrippa told Caligula. But Caligula was a very suspicious man. Uh, he, was, he was crazy and, and probably paranoid and, and it, it, all those skits. So all those bad terms that the psychologists use, uh, demon possession would probably be the better one to describe this man. He was that wicked. So he doesn't trust this other ambitious fellow. So when Antipas comes to town, instead of getting a kingdom, he's arrested and exiled to Lyons, a city in Gaul. Today we call it France, right? Leon. But he is sent as a prisoner now to Lyons, all because he wanted a bigger kingdom. <laughs> and his treacherous relative... And it gets confusing as to their exact relationships because everybody's in America there. It's just a little craftier than him. And so his end, not glorious at all. He is taken and sent as a prisoner and dies in exile away from Rome, away from power. Gaul or France was the frontier back in those days and times. And so he was exiled to the frontier where all the fighting was being done, where the line was constantly shifting as to who was in control of what area all the time. The Gauls were constantly fighting with the Romans. And this is where he is sent to finish out his life in this worn, torn. It'd be like if you were sent to Syria right now. And we said, okay, you ticked off. Donald J. Trump. And so he bought you a one-way ticket to take your pick. You can have Afghanistan, or you can have Syria, or we'll even let you go to Iraq. Which of those places? Maybe North Korea would be one of your prayers. See, that's the kind of idea. That's what, that's what Caligula did to this guy. He sent him to a place like that, like you and I would not want to go to. And uh, that's where he ends his life. And so a life of ambition, I tell you, is sure to fail because there's some other ambition. And the problem with ambitious people, they don't trust each other. And so one ambitious fellow to another, you're ultimately, there's, you're going to meet somebody who is just as ambitious, if not more ambitious than you, and they're going to want what you have. And so Philip, whose life, he lost his wife, but probably a good thing because after all, he lost Herodias out Good, because that's when you lose her. Uh, maybe he was slightly devastated for a while. This man, left, remember his first wife I told you about, whose dad was the king of Arabia? The king of Arabia goes to war with this guy for almost the rest of his life. There's always this war going on over there. Very costly war. It wears down his, his treasure chest. And that's probably part of the problem with the Romans. They're trying to keep peace all over the place. And this guy's causing a war that doesn't need to be waged. And so taking up Roman resources, maybe that's where they get the accusation that he's really a traitor because he's not working for the peace. Pax Romana, he wasn't working for it. Second point that we make here is opportunity for good often comes as a choice to be made. He had a choice. He could have let John the Baptist go. And he didn't. He could have agreed with Pilate and found no fault with Jesus, but he didn't. You see how history would, would, would think of him a little differently if he had simply said, I find no fault in this man. Instead, he's angry because he didn't see a miracle. Shows him to be a very small man. 
He had a lot of choices. His wife, he could have stayed with his first wife and had a wealthy kingdom. But instead, he makes the wrong choice, so he spends the rest of his life going to war with her dad, who happened to be the king of Arabia. You can do good. And see, it usually it comes down to choices that we make. We have the chance to do something for God, and it almost always comes as a choice. You can either do this, or you can do that. And if we choose wrong, then we bring shame to God. If we choose good, then we can bring honor and glory. So sometimes we think, how can I do something great for God? Just make the right choice. Just make the right choice. You have to always, and this, of course Herod didn't do this, he never asked himself, what does God want me to do? Because if he had ever asked himself that question, he probably wouldn't have done any of the things that we know he has done. He never concerned himself with what God wanted, only with what he wants. I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. How do I get it? Well, I can lie, cheat, and steal. I can lie, cheat, and steal. And I can lie, cheat, and steal. And then one day, somebody came by and said, Hey, I want what he's got. How do I get what Antipas has? Oh, I know. I'll lie, cheat, and steal. And so somebody lied, cheated, and steal. He loses everything. Ends up a prisoner. Because he made the wrong choice. You know, if he had chosen not to go to Rome, I will be satisfied. Isn't that what Paul tells us? That we're supposed to be satisfied with what I have. He wasn't satisfied. Paul said, in whatever state I am, I have learned therewith to be satisfied. He wasn't satisfied. So he goes to Rome looking for more and instead ends up with less. He doesn't gain anything. He loses everything simply because of the choice he made to be a little more greedy. And so we don't see him in history. We don't see him in the Bible as anything good. Uh, even crazy old Caligula didn't like him. And that's, you got to be pretty bad. Because he likes bad people. And so, wow, what kind of a character must you be that even Khalid didn't like you? Let's pray.